I like talking about issues that affect transit planning on this channel, sort of like logical fallacies, but for transit planners. So often the problems in transit projects are the same from project to project and city to city, so much so that there are some common fallacies that exist around the world. But almost no problem has been as pronounced for me as what my friends and I call corridor fixation. So what is it? How does it throw a wrench in transit planning? And what can we actually do about it? Let's talk. Welcome to RM Transit, a channel about transportation planning, how it goes wrong, and how to get it right. Corridor fixation is what it sounds like. It's when planners and advocates are particularly fixated on one given corridor, when well not being so fixated and taking a broader look might lead to public transit that better serves the public at large. For example, look at the 2nd Avenue subway plans in New York. Some have suggested that swinging the line to the east as it travels south from Manhattan would provide much needed coverage and transit connections, all while maintaining capacity. Right now, the plan for the 2nd Avenue subway has it following 2nd Avenue all the way to Houston Street, then continuing along Christie Street staying close to both the Lexington Avenue line and the Broadway line. If the line were to instead start diverting east as it approached 14th Street, it could better serve the rapid transit deserts of Stytown, the East Village, Alphabet City, and the Lower East Side, while better connecting to the L and F trains. Now, there have been debates about doing something like this in the past. Diverting does potentially lead to a slower trip, and it does also potentially leave more people on other subway lines in this part of Manhattan. These are real concerns, and they should be weighed. But when you do weigh them, you realize they're probably not an issue. As you travel south in Manhattan, the capacity crunch on the north-south subway lines, which become more plentiful, is less severe. And lines are already extremely close together. At the same time, even if a diverted 2nd Avenue subway is slower, it still won't be slow because it's an underground rapid transit line. Plus, in this case, the trade-off is probably worth it, because giving up a little bit of speed allows you to serve some immensely dense and underserved communities. Perhaps the most notable issue with this plan is that it takes the 2nd Avenue subway off of 2nd Avenue, well before 2nd Avenue disappears at Houston Street. It's the 2nd Avenue subway, not the Alphabet City subway. There's often a belief that rapid transit lines should continue along predefined corridors, instead of risking potentially higher costs or longer travel times. Or so the corridor fixation logic goes. And in this case, you might say, race, you're constantly advocating for faster and less expensive transit. Why would you suddenly suggest that those aren't the number one priority? The truth is, I like to think I advocate for better trade-offs. In many places, transit is too expensive and too slow. But the truth is, going slower is only bad if it's for dubious benefit. If it means way more service to high-density neighborhoods, then it's a positive thing. All elements of a transit project need to exist in a sort of balance. And while I think in many cities the balance is all too often weighed towards slower rather than faster, it can go the other way as well. Of course, direct routes and complete corridor coverage seem like good things, because they often are. Especially when you're, say, doing something like cut and cover construction, and that helps things tilt in the cost-effective direction. But for the most part, the 2nd Avenue subway won't be built cut and cover, and you have to consider how you're balancing the other priorities. So often, transit plans don't reflect the needs of the places they serve. In sprawling cities where transit needs to go fast to attract lots of riders, not going fast is a problem. But for somewhere like Manhattan, which is already extremely dense and has a ton of fast express subways, maybe the lack of truly rapid rapid transit isn't the biggest priority. Instead, filling in dead zones like exist on the east side of lower Manhattan might be a bigger priority. But this is far from the only case of corridor fixation, which does tend to appear more often in gridded cities. That's probably just because there are more obvious corridors to fixate on. London doesn't have nearly as much of a corridor fixation problem as New York, for example. It does have other problems, and that's largely because there aren't a lot of clear corridors that actually exist. That's why the tube map has so many meandering and winding lines. There just aren't that many long, straight streets you can build a subway under. One type of corridor fixation that's really common is fixating on a particular street instead of the broader corridor. This might look like building a tram on said street instead of building on a parallel railway corridor. They could let you go much faster for less money. 
or building a subway under the main street instead of an adjacent street or a back alley, which might be far simpler and less expensive. Oftentimes, if a subway is deep below ground, you can get people back over to the main street by the time they've actually reached the surface. And of course, a lot of these alternatives do come up in planning, but they're often thrown away without acknowledging things like extremely high costs, which could be addressed by choosing better corridors. If a certain street is going to have a subway built near it, maybe building it slightly further away but at way lower costs is the right decision in cities which are struggling to get anything built for a reasonable price. This also disregards that in many rapid transit systems, riders aren't trying to get to a destination along a particular corridor. They're just trying to head in a certain direction quickly. If you say have a subway system that consists entirely of a single north-south line, when you're placing your east-west line there might be certain preferences, but for a lot of riders any east-west subway line that's located fairly centrally will do, because ultimately they're still going to have to connect at both ends, they just want to go east-west quickly. It might seem counterintuitive, but sometimes the transit riders along a certain transit route that travels along a certain street aren't ever really headed to destinations on that street, or at least they are infrequently. And that's fine, that's just how networks work. Another issue is avoiding meandering or going off corridor to serve major destinations or transit connections. Of course, it can be easy to make a drawing that makes these kinds of routings look silly. Add some 90 degree angles in and do a zoom and you can have a pretty ridiculous looking transit map. But the reality is transit systems aren't natural things, and sometimes the best solution is one that might not look entirely natural. For example, Toronto's new downtown subway was originally planned to travel east and then north out of downtown, a fairly simple route. But the current Ontario line instead dips to the south, the opposite direction that the line is ultimately headed, but this is to access a rail corridor, where it can not only be built more cost effectively, but also with better connections to adjacent train lines. All of that is likely with minimal time penalty, because sometimes in rapid transit the most direct route isn't actually the fastest route. Sometimes it's worth asking if you should even be on a particular corridor, and sometimes it's worth asking whether you could leave and then come back. You'll sometimes see plans which remain on corridor for no other obvious reason besides consistency. And this is really bad, especially when people start talking about a particular project as the Street A Subway. Talking about planning a line which serves a corridor, but then framing that as a line on a particular street narrows people's imagination, and makes alternative routes that might achieve the same or even better things seem alternative. That's why I prefer to see plans which speak in corridors highlight broad areas instead of particular lines. That provides everyone involved the mental space to consider various alignments which might follow a general corridor but aren't necessarily on one particular street. And none of this is limited to rapid transit. The desire for uniform treatment along long transit corridors is a big issue for light rail and buses. For example, having continuous bus lanes along an entire street corridor or having a tram route which always remains in the middle of the street with the tracks together. This might align well with a particular person's OCD that suggests that a route needs to be the same along the entire length of a corridor, but often it isn't cost effective. In a suburban area with not a ton of traffic, you probably don't need bus lanes, and saving the money building those bus lanes might allow you to build a priority intersection somewhere else where the impacts are much more real. The last common example I've seen is an obsession with extensions forever. A train or tram route doesn't necessarily need to be perennially extended, and it doesn't even need to be set up for that. Sometimes the best thing for a system or a city is to just terminate a route, or even turn it onto an entirely different corridor where it can provide different value. You can actually see another great case of this with the 2nd Avenue subway. I remember looking at plans for it years and years ago and thinking it would be natural for it to end traveling west along 125th Street, creating tons of new north-south connections in northern Manhattan and forming a northern crosstown line, even if the rest of the line was really about north-south travel. That is opposed to, say, considering northern extensions of the line as a top priority into the Bronx. Sometimes corridor fixation truly goes beyond the particular street a line is on and considers only the corridor and suggests it might only be north-south or east-west, when being both might be even better. Of course, all of this is again about balance. If you've studied networks or spent a lot of time looking at transit maps, you'll know that diversions are not uncommon, but as diversions get larger and larger, they become less and less common. 
you could probably write some sort of mathematical rule where divergence start to become problematic, both in terms of perception and distance traveled, when a diverted route starts to be more than, let's say, one and a half times the distance of a straight shot one, and definitely when it becomes over two times the length. For example, LA's Crenshaw line diverting into West Hollywood looks very indirect and feels extremely unnatural. And while unnatural might not mean bad, in this case, it's extremely unnatural. So to close out, why do I think corridor fixation actually happens? I actually think to some degree this fixation happens because of the limitations of an above ground streets based urbanism compared to rapid transit planning. Planners, transit advocates, and urbanists tend to be the type of people that love the local, short sections of streets that have cafes, restaurants, and shops that they really enjoy. These things are great, obviously, but they're often not the best thing to plan rapid transit that will likely be around for a century or around. That's because streets and urban places change, they ebb and they flow, but rapid transit generally doesn't. It's not a good idea that in some circles, the idea of building rapid transit disconnected from the above ground street grid seems sacrilegious. People also often don't have a great grasp of the actual distances in their cities, especially in neighborhoods they're not so familiar with. For example, that diversion of the 2nd Avenue subway I mentioned earlier, while it seems really big, it only adds around half a mile to the distance of the line, which is already over 8 miles long. That means that while only adding a few minutes to the travel time compared to the straight shot route, it adds a ton of coverage and new connection points. While probably adding less travel time than just a couple more stations on the straight shot alignment would. There's also the issue of network flow. Well, a planner living downtown might think the particular downtown route of a new downtown subway is very important for the many travelers who are coming from other parts of the city. They really just want good connections and a route that's proximal to their major destinations. They're probably walking anyways, and so the particular street might be less important than a cost-effective or quick-to-build route that provides the benefits of transit much sooner. Unfortunately, it often comes down to lines on the map transit planning. That's where it's often easy to draw straight, continuous lines along a proposed planned transit network. But when the reality for actually building those routes that balances costs, speed, and connectivity has the routes taking less of a direct path. Of course, this isn't usually the case for surface transit, even BRT and LRT systems, which have to at least acknowledge the surface street layout as long as they're above ground and which often take more time to go through intersections, thus slowing down diversions. Rapid transit, particularly underground or above ground rapid transit, simply plays by different rules than surface transit. There are real differences between planning access for a bus or a subway or an intercity train. Typically, for faster, longer journeys, people are willing to travel further to actually access that transit. So perhaps while riding a slow bus or tram, people really care about having a close stop. For rapid transit, people are usually willing to walk a few blocks over. Ultimately, corridor fixation is a big problem, but like so many problems in transit planning and in thinking, being aware of it is the best way to address it. If you like hearing about fallacies in planning decisions and planning decisions to avoid, then check out the playlist in the top right. And as always, thanks for watching.